Welcome to Out of the Question, a podcast that looks behind some common questions and uncovers the question behind the question while providing real solutions for biblical world and life view. Your co-hosts are Pastor Steve Macias and Andrea Schwartz, a teacher and mentor. Welcome to this edition of the Out of the Question podcast. Hi, Steve. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Oh, good. So we're going to ask a timely question today, and some of you might think, well, that's an odd question, but it's a question that comes up pretty regularly in Christian circles, and that question is, why do we call the holy day, the holiday that we are going to celebrate this coming Sunday, why do we call it Easter? Why isn't it called Resurrection Day? Right. And the question behind there is that many people have reservations about holy days or even days beyond Christmas and Easter because they see all of the kind of pagan imagery or pagan etymology associated with some words. And then they go to this kind of genetic fallacy of saying if it looks or sounds like pagan worship or, or paganism at all, then it must be wrong. And so what we're going to talk about today, specifically in Easter, is is the word Easter and the practice of Easter pagan, um, which I'm going to argue it is not. And then how does that reflect on how we as Christians interact with the world and things that are often confused as pagan, but are actually the domain of the Lord? Okay, just to kind of clarify and put it into context, obviously something like a symbol like the rainbow was symbolic of God's promise to man. But the rainbow has been appropriated by those who are in rebellion against God and celebrate their sinfulness. So you'll see rainbows on LGBTQ stuff. So it's what you're saying is just because a group has appropriated something isn't good enough reason for us to not embrace the symbology that it started with? Right. And I would say the exact opposite is true. Uh, the scripture says the earth is the Lord's and all that therein is. Um, but most Christians, because we have a very narrow view of Christian history, you know, many of us who are of the Protestant persuasion have a view of history that's maybe five or 600 years old. And so we become timid with what belongs to God. And we allow the world to define our terms rather than saying, how the scripture says, creation was made good. Creation is what Christ has come to restore. And in our language and in our choice of how we describe the world that we're in, are we behaving like sentimentalists who have narrow and very shallow roots in our culture? Or are we true reconstructionists, true dominionists who say everything from the sun's shining (laughs) to the moon's rising Everything belongs to the Lord. And so there's really nothing outside of Christ's dominion that he had come to transform and redeem. But of course, sinful man will take things like the sun, the moon, and other creatures and begin to worship them. So we're not throwing out the idea that people can sin in practices. But I think what you're saying is, Let's not give the store away because somebody takes some of our stuff. Yes. And uh, that when we give away the store, that we actually lose quite a bit too. That the, the biblical religion is a historical religion. It's a tactile religion. It's a religion full of not just the text, but of symbols. And there are layers to Christianity that are not immediately available to the new convert. And so when we become steeped in our scripture, different things that we don't quite understand at a surface level become more apparent and make the the resurrection make more sense as you study the history and see how God has revealed himself in the world. Okay, so let's start off with the word Easter. What is the derivation? Where does it come from? And does it have anything to do with bunnies? (laughs) <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, well, the word Easter as we celebrate it today uh, is often the day set apart on the calendar to celebrate the resurrection. 
And the word itself comes from England. And you know, pre-Christian times, there was a goddess of fertility called Eoster. Um, so Easter, Eoster, you can see how these are kind of similar sounding things. And if you go back to the 6th century, uh, one of the great Christian thinkers, uh, the Venerable Bede, who really gives us a, a Celtic understanding of Christianity. This is one of the scholars that the Reformation went back to to show that the Roman church did not have primacy. Um, so Bede describes how Christians celebrate the resurrection in the springtime. And he connects the, the Passover, which is often called the, the Pashka, to the season of new birth. And speaking to an English audience, he said, in the same time that you celebrate your springtime festivals, worshiping Eoster, you know, uh, in, in the ancient Celtic religions, they had the month of Eoster, kind of like how we have, you know, the month of March or the month of February. So in the month of Eoster, you celebrate your springtime festival where the vernal equinox happens and new things come up out of the ground. Well, our new springtime where everything comes back to life is the feast of the resurrection. And so Bede begins to equate the idea of springtime or new birth with this season of Eoster. And it's uh, a common thing to see when cultures collide like that, the language kind of becomes merged. Now, in some places, Easter Day is called Pashka, right? Which is this uh, Greek translation of the word from Hebrew to describe the Passover. So Easter Day in our modern parlance means Pashka, which means, you know, some type of commemoration of the Passover, no single person today is remembering Eoster. <laughs> and in fact, uh, what Bede has effectively done by claiming the month of Easter and taking it back to the story of the resurrection is he put an end to really any recognition of this fertility goddess and replaced it uh, completely with the celebration of a Christian Easter. So just because modern society has secularized holy days. So, for example, Christmas, instead of the celebration of the nativity, the incarnation, this, this reset of history, you might say, and now we reduce it to reindeers and snowmen and Thanksgiving, which is a biblical feast to have a time of Thanksgiving. We've reduced it to turkeys and whatever else we do. In the same way, Easter has been secularized, but it's not a going back to this fertility cult. It's just the fact that in the vacuum, and a merchandising vacuum and a commercialism, this is new things for people to sell. Easter eggs, Easter bunny, Easter chocolate, things like that. And we tend to think it went that direction, but it's actually not how it happened. Uh, Easter in the Christian sense, is the origin of these traditions. Uh, the old Celtic religion didn't have a day of celebration. Um, like I said, it was, it was a month to describe it. Compare it today to the days of the week we have in the American calendar, right? So we have Monday, the celebration of the moon god. We have Tuesday, a uh, celebration of Hermes. We have Odin's day or Wednesday, the celebration of Odin of the Norse mythology or Thor's day. Um, nobody who says today is Thursday and on Thursday we eat, you know, enchiladas is somehow worshiping Thor by eating, you know, enchiladas on that day. Um, it became associated with that time. It was a title applied to it, but nobody honestly thinks that by marking Thursday down on your calendar that you are worshiping a false god called Thor. And the same way Bede made the argument that just because they called this season Easter, or what we would say springtime, doesn't mean that we have to accept their definition of what springtime is. And in fact, many of the symbols that we associate with Easter today, take the bunny, take the egg, <laughs> take the, uh, the lilies, or all of these common Easter ideas sprang up from Christian practices 
inside of the resurrection that then spread to the rest of the world. We can get upset if we want about chocolate eggs and uh, Easter bunnies and shopping malls. But what those things point to are ways that Christians held on to their traditions and folklore and used it to explain the gospel. So, for example, uh, Christians throughout the season of Lent give up different kinds of meats, right? So in the 7th century, the Venerable Bede would have admonished the members of his abbey and the members of his community during these 40 days of Lent, we eat no meat, including eggs. And so on Easter Sunday, what comes out but eggs, and not just any eggs, but they're so excited after fasting from eggs for 40 days that they colored their eggs and they dyed them and they decorated them and they put them on fancy platters and they said, here comes the Lord's feast. Uh, The Lord has brought us from fasting into feasting. So there's one sense in which the egg is there. But there's a lot of layers to this as well. What is the resurrection but the new birth of the new creation, both for the individual believer and for the life of the world? And so if you read some of the other church fathers, like St. John Chrysostom, whose church did not celebrate Ishtar or Esotar, but rather just the Greek version of Pashka, they took the eggs and they said the outer layer, layer of the egg, this shell that you crack to get the egg, that's like the old creation. And Christ, who was inside of the egg, broke through the shell. And just like the old world that was cursed by Adam, the old shell has dissolved, and Christ has given birth to a new creation. And that's what the resurrection was all about. So I think that we want to give too much credit to the pagans. Instead of saying, you know, the Lord is the one who made every animal, every tree, every flower, every color. And so... There's, there's a real reason to look at these symbols as St. Paul describes them, you know, that, that nature reveals the glory of God. So it sounds to me that one of the biggest deficits of modern Christianity is a lack of perspective and history. Not only, as you pointed out, it only goes a couple of centuries back where people are trying to ascertain the emergence of Christianity But without a working understanding of the Old Testament, then the whole idea of Pascha doesn't make a lot of sense. If you don't understand that it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world has to do with the sacrificial Lamb at Passover and how Christ is the fulfillment of that, You have, it's like somebody, you know, becomes a citizen of a country but doesn't know anything about its history or anything about what it means to be a citizen. And I would dare say that a lot of people who were born into citizenship in the United States don't know as much as those who are naturalized often and have studied and actually have to pass the test. Modern Christendom doesn't even require a test of any sort to prove yourself informed. Yeah, it's true. Um, Even the the old bare minimum standard of the of the Apostles' Creed at baptism. I mean, most Christians will say things like, no creed but Christ. Uh, They don't know the scripture. They don't know the basic statements of the faith. They don't know their own history. Uh, But these same folks will tell you, well, you can't celebrate Christmas or Easter or any of these pagan Roman Catholic holidays. So it is interesting. Uh, The other point is, is as we're discussing the origin of Easter, uh, many people will point out that in the early American colonies, the, the Puritans or the New England uh, colonies refused to celebrate things like Christmas and Easter. And uh, often these two ideas are conflated, that somehow that the Puritans recognized that there was a pagan origin and so therefore refused to celebrate them. Um, but that's really not the history there either. What happens often in cultures is that when we detach the biblical faith from the call to obedience, uh, these festivals, whether it be Christmas or your birthday, become excuses for licentious behavior. They become excuses for you to to have a good time. Um, What you'll see, maybe not this year because of all of the COVID lockdowns, but typically what you'll see uh, in traditional churches after they've done 40 days of fasting is that they'll have this giant feast at sunrise on Easter. 
uh, complete with beer and, and food. And you would think that they were, were gluttons and drunkards because of how much they will consume here at 6 a.m. in the morning as the sun rises. Um, and that's what the early American Puritans saw as kind of an excess. You know, they saw an excess in Lenten discipline, forcing the conscience of an individual to not eat this, to not eat that. They thought that was an excess. And they saw the excess in parties of parading statues and having, you know, these elaborate feasts. And so the American Puritans, if you read their writings, didn't object to the feasts of, of Easter and and Christmas on the grounds that they had some mystical origin, uh, but rather that they were responding to a cultural moment where people were not able to find things in moderation. Okay, you brought up Lent. So answer this question. Um, having been raised Catholic myself, I remember that when Lent came around, it was a big deal. What were you going to give up for Lent? And of course, you know, I was willing to give up, you know, asparagus if I didn't like it, but my mother would point out that you don't give up something that you don't like for Lent. And so it would amount to things like chocolate or dessert or things of that nature. Where did the idea of giving up something for Lent and Lent as a season, did, did it have to do with how the church calendar communicated things to an illiterate group of people, people who couldn't read? How did it come about? Well, I would argue, as a, as a traditional Christian, <laughs> that the origin of Lent comes from the words of our Lord Jesus himself, uh, who when his disciples see him casting out a demon, he, he tells his disciples that some demons can only come out through prayer and fasting. And now fasting is an important part of Christ's own life. Uh, it's the 40 days of fasting in the wilderness. Fasting is a part of uh, the early church life as well. It's, it's some, something of a sign of recognizing the goodness in this world by depriving yourself of it. Uh, this type of abstinence is somehow seen in the eyes of Christ as a source of strength. Um, so it's often described uh, giving up something for Lent as a way to sharpen your mortal sense of what that thing is. So, for example, uh, the early church fathers described Lent as a discipline in confession or a mortification, where if you were struggling with a particular sin, here's an annual reminder that every vice has a virtue. And so if a, if a man is struggling with impious thoughts, there is a opposite side of that that you can embrace in order to combat that particular sin. And you can see this not only in medieval writing or patristic writing, but in Hebrew and Platonic and, and Greek thought, that this idea that the body and soul are connected, that there is not this kind of like intellectual chasm between what we do and what we think, but rather that the disciplines of our body, uh, moderate eating, exercise, uh, you know, being kind, managing your anger, that those are not just limited to kind of like this physical person, but that they have a spiritual sense in which they impact. Uh, so there's a famous quote from St. Thomas Aquinas, where he describes that the best way for a man to overcome sexual immorality is to watch what he consumes as far as he eats. Meaning that just like St. James describes in the very beginning of his epistle, uh, that controlling our actions controls our ability to control other parts of our body. So St. James describes this in the sense of a tongue being the rudder of a boat. Lent and giving something up or, or fasting in any sense is training some part of your body to be more in line with the fruits of the Spirit. And then that allows the Christian to grow, to strengthen, to, to become better dominion-oriented in other areas of life. But it has to start with, with something. Okay, so here's another question for you, because I always rely on the fact that your knowledge of history and this is really quite good. So since the Passover had to do with a lamb, and since Jesus is described as a lamb, how on earth did we get the Easter ham? <laughs> you know, I wish I, I knew that one. I don't know when it came about to be the Easter ham. Uh, I imagine that that's probably a more modern tradition. But 
<laughs> the there are some places you can still get a good Easter lamb, and I, I hope we would all return to that tradition. Right, because I, I would joke, it's the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, not the ham of God. And of course, just the very nature that it's ham as opposed to beef when um, the foods that the Hebrew people, one of them that they would abstain from would be pork as well. So uh, maybe one of our listeners knows the origins of the Easter ham and can share that with us. <laughs> yeah, well, we, we can say What's interesting with connection of ham and Passover, uh, I don't know if it correct, connects directly to our modern practice, uh, but the sacrifice of a pig on the altar on Passover was what the pagans would do. So the, there's the example during uh, the prefiguration of the Hanukkah story with Judas Maccabee, where the Romans come in and the way that they desecrate the temple is they sacrifice a pig there in the Holy of Holies. And so uh, there, there is an interesting connection there that, that God's understanding of Passover had to be a specific animal. It had to be a specific condition of that animal and that Jesus in his human flesh was typified in the Passover lamb. Right. So by very nature of creation, how God designed it, a pig never would have been an acceptable sacrifice. Right, for, for a number of reasons. I mean, uh, but the, the interesting part uh, with the Passover story in connection with resurrection uh, is all of these various fertility symbols. Uh, pigs are never associated with fertility symbols. Pigs are always, you know, bottom eaters, eat their own trash, eat anything really, um, and associated with uncleanness, biblically and uncleanness as a matter of sanitation uh they're associated with disease um, and rightfully so but the story of rabbits or peacocks or the phoenix or the eggs all of these kind of easter symbols that we largely associate with you know modern mythology are really christian origin uh, for example if you go into the catacombs of early christian churches second third fourth century You'll see above their altars these giant elaborate carvings of peacocks with the, you know, the feathers and all that stuff. And the early Christians made the connection between the story or the mythology of the peacock and the story of, of the Passover lamb. Uh, in Greek and Hellenistic thinking, they had all of these strange myths about animals. And so uh, some of our listeners will know the story of like the phoenix, right? The phoenix is the bird that that burns up into ashes and then the ashes come back together and the bird is reborn, right? Christians use that symbol to describe the story of Jesus to the pagans. They also use the story of the peacock. Uh, but what was interesting about the peacock is even until the Middle Ages, not much was really understood about it. And there were all of this, especially in Western Europe, all of this zoological mythology, meaning they wrote it down in the textbook as though it was true, but today we know it's not true. So they believe that the flesh of a peacock would never, uh, would never spoil. So, for example, if you, you went out hunting and you shot a peacock, uh, you wouldn't need to refrigerate it. You wouldn't need to do any of that kind of stuff because the flesh never really dies. And so the peacock then, this is first, second century Christianity, became the symbol of like the Passover lamb. Even though the Passover lamb is slaughtered, Jesus didn't really decompose he came back to life and so you can see christianity from its very beginning has used these you know overtly pagan symbols to explain the story uh, but as gk chesterton points out in uh, the everlasting man the pagans didn't invent these symbols the pagans are looking at the world and trying to make sense out of a world that's orderly that's structured that has all these signs and types and they come up with the wrong answer they become worshiping the creation but they were looking at the same creation that you and I are looking at. Uh, this is really important in Hebrew religion because what we often miss when we read the Old Testament is we try to read the Old Testament with a you know, 21st century rationalistic mind. We are more informed by Hegel and Kant, and we become people who study God rather than people who worship God. You get a bunch of Christians together, we're going to have a, a Bible study. You get a bunch of Christians together, we're going to examine the text of the scripture. We're going to talk about how this makes us think about something. But every Near Eastern religion prior to the time of Christ 
didn't study their gods, they worshiped their gods. So if your god was nature, as it was for the Romans or the Greeks or the Norse or any of these people, they began to worship the creatures and look for god-like uh, aspects of the creature that were worthy of worship. Well, since the creation reveals who God is, uh, we can see in their pagan myths how these things reveal the true God of creation. Interestingly enough, today uh, we have fallen into the same trap where uh, evolutionary thinking really worships the creation rather than the creator, and it looks for patterns and methods of change and interlineage inside the creation rather than looking for evidence of the creator and all of these common ancestors or common attributes, uh, which is really you know, a genetic fallacy exemplified, not just in the etymology of the name Easter, but in how we see history and how we see the Bible. Wow, that was a lot. And uh, <laughs> interesting. A lot. No, that, it's like I said, I, I appreciate the fact that you are a student of history. Now, one of the things that I know marked the early church was on Easter, um, they would say, Christ is risen, and the response would be, Christ is risen indeed. Correct? Correct. Okay. Well, there is a modern trend in Christianity where Christians are going to recreate the Passover Seder and, you know, have this idea of putting blood on the door, etc. Now, I realize that in many of these cases, they, they don't slaughter a lamb and put the blood on the door. They might have paint on the door or whatever. But did the early church continue to practice the Passover Seder, or did they really institute the Lord's Supper as the replacement um, celebration? The Lord's Supper, often called the Last Supper, should also be understood to be the Last cedar. Uh, one thing you should take a step back and acknowledge is that every modern Hebrew scholar will agree with you in saying this, that the cedar that is practiced today, even by groups like Jews for Jesus, is not the same cedar meal that was practiced at the time of Christ and his apostles. Uh, some of you who are, are scholars and who have read into the kind of uh, development of theology in Jewish tradition can look at uh, things like the Mishnah, uh, or the Midrash, and see that from the time of Christ, there was a challenge to the authority of the Sanhedrin and of the Jewish uh, powers that be. And when Christ rents the temple curtain at the crucifixion, he really destroys every sense in which the sacrificial system of the temple had any type of standing. And Jews from that time begin to change and reform how they understood even things like the Passover. Uh, and so a lot of the things that you would see in a Seder meal today, you know, the inclusion of, uh, at the exclusion of the things specifically mentioned in the scripture, but, you know, these, these uh, bags with three layers and how they set the table and these different little aspects that have been added throughout the year make the Seder meal practice today markedly different than it would have been celebrated at Christ's time. And that's because, the Jews at Christ's time did not did not continue on the Hebrew faith, right? If you imagine the lineage of Adam to Abraham uh, to Moses and so on, it got to a fork in the road at the time of Christ. And when Christ is weeping over Jerusalem, he's not saying, if only the Jews would return back to me. He is saying, there is nobody in all of Israel who truly worships God. So even though the Jews at that time would have been practicing Passover, they weren't even at Christ's time doing it according to his ordinance. Uh, he had to go and purify the temple himself because even the temple wasn't functioning according to his standards. And so what often Christians think, and we even have this phrase, uh, Judeo-Christian values, is that from the time of Christ, there was one group of, of godly people that went off called the, you know, the Jews and one group of godly people that went off and they were the Christians. But that's not what happened is God completely shifted the covenant from the nation of Israel and the 12 tribes into the person of Jesus and his 12 disciples. And so the proper Passover 
is fulfilled and ended in the sacrificial lamb, the Agnus Dei of Jesus Christ. And so what the Exodus story was remembering is their deliverance from Egypt into the promised land in anticipation for what happened at Golgotha. So when we celebrate the Last Supper and commemorate it each and every Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, and then once a year as a special celebration of Easter, we are saying that Jesus fulfilled, made whole the Passover meal. Everybody was waiting for the coming Messiah. To celebrate a Passover meal today is, in one sense, to deny Jesus as the Messiah. Right. And I, I don't believe that the people who like to do this or think it's um, meaningful to do it are necessarily intentionally making an affront to Jesus's crucifixion, him being the ultimate sacrifice. But I think a lot of it goes back to the idea of ritual and festival, etc., because we have associated that anything that we do has pomp and circumstance to it, that somehow or other we're indulging in paganism. And so we, the church has lost, by and large, the sense of making something special, yet people don't seem to have a problem when they have Olympic parades or Fourth of July parades. It seems like it's acceptable every place except the church. Right. And, and again, they, they forget the historical consequence of Easter. Uh, sometimes folks will say, well, isn't every Sunday Easter? Can't we just celebrate the resurrection every Sunday? And I say, yes, please do. Celebrate Holy Communion every single Sunday and remember Christ has died, Christ has risen. Absolutely. But what they often miss is that for the first several centuries of the church, Easter was the point in which new converts could enter into the church. Right? So there was the idea of the, the catechumenate, the that new people who were being brought into the church, that pastors would train, disciple, and catechize them. And they would have to wait this entire season of Lent to prove themselves as knowledgeable of the scriptures, as true converts. And then on Easter, the season of new birth, season of resurrection, you know, the, the eggs and bunnies and fertility, in this season of the vernal equinox, they would come dressed in white, just like the lilies of the field, and they would be baptized and become new creations under Christ. Now, you could say that happens every Sunday, but there's no picture greater than what Easter does as a prefiguration of what is described in the book of Revelation of Jesus clothing his saints in white robes. Yes, yes, indeed. So we're at the end of our time. Are there any books or articles that you think might be useful for people who say, I want to dig into this a little deeper? Well, on the idea of Christian history, uh, Foundations of Social Order by, by Dr. Rush Tooney uh, gives us a kind of a truly Catholic, not Roman Catholic, universal Catholic view of the church. And if you're new to the idea of studying church history, Dr. Rush Tooney explains how the the divinity and the humanity of Christ forms the foundation for really the fabric of who we are. And then specifically about these traditions that many people assume had their origins in paganism and are still pagan, would you have any recommendations for that? Well, I, I quoted two folks. Uh, the first one was the Venerable Bede. And so the ecclesiastical history of the English people uh, should be required reading for all Western Christians. Uh, it's available pretty commonly penguin paperbacks has a, a version for four dollars and that really shows how the ancient celtic the english church existed before there was a pope before there was you know a worldwide catholic church um, and how they understood their interaction with pagans and non-believers which would be helpful in the sense because we live in a somewhat post-christian age and we're doing the same thing that Bede had to do in england um, the other author I mentioned was St. John Chrysostom, and he has uh, published inside of uh, the Antonicene Fathers Collection a bunch of his Easter sermons, which he goes at great lengths to explain the origin of rabbits and why we use eggs. And, and John Chrysostom mentions this early Christian 
kind of legend of red eggs that you still see in the Greek Orthodox Church today of why do we dye the eggs? Because there was a, a, a woman in the market who was sharing her faith with another person. The person didn't believe in the resurrection. She said, if you believe in the resurrection, these eggs I give you will turn red. He believes he goes home, the eggs turn red. Therefore, we dye eggs every year, not knowing the story, but thinking of some kind of strange you know, commercialism, not knowing that this, this was a, a story of evangelism in the very early days of the church. So St. John Chrysostom, the, the golden-mouthed preacher of the 6th century, very important as well. Well, in closing, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you, everyone, for listening. And join us again next time for another edition of the Out of the Question podcast. Thanks for listening to Out of the Question. For more information on this and other topics, please visit calcedon.edu.